Uh, we'd love to hear them. You ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I'm so excited about this. Tyrone Muggsy Bogues is on line five. <laughs> This man, I don't, let's get, uh, get, even if he was 6'1", 44-inch vertical leap. Pride of North Carolina. Pride of Wake Forest. He remembers Washington when they were the Bullets. I want to talk to you about that, by the way. I hate the name, the Wizards. Why? I know it's violence, but the Bullets was a great name. Uh, hey, you know, I remember was it Rob Horry called this era of the Charlotte Hornets that this man was the general for. Mm. Uh, the coolest team in the NBA. And I was going down a deep, deep, deep wormhole with you last night. And you guys were. You guys were that, like, mid-90s Hornets were the coolest of the cool. Wearing the shades in the locker room, yeah. wearing the fucking bespoke suits. Um, well, uh, and by the way, we are here, of course, to promote his new book that uh, should be on every list, and including Baker's. We are here with uh, Mike Baker, uh, Muggsy. Before we uh, let him go, Mike. Go ahead. Yeah. Ask ask the man himself any questions you've got. He is as good at the CIA as you were uh, as a point guard, my friend. I, and, and it's true. And I was I was also the uh, the smallest uh, CIA covert operations officer. <laughs> um, and uh, but I was not the legend that, that Muggsy is. I got to tell you, this is a real honor. Uh, just having a chance to talk to you. What a what a tremendous what a tremendous career you had! One of the greatest point guards of all time. Uh, I, I just want to ask you one question, Muggsy, and this comes from uh, from my boy uh, Sammy, uh, who uh -huh. is all basketball all the time. He plays point guard, and he's uh, he's always the smallest uh, player on the court. Um, he's usually the youngest, but he's he's got a question about your high school career. Was Dunbar? Do you think Dunbar, the team you played on? Uh, I think it was like 80. Was that still? Uh-oh. Of course, we get right to the part of his question he's about to ask. We just lost you a second there, Baker. But it was something about Dunbar. Oh, no. It was, it was the, it, 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 like, oh, no. no, no, say it again. You, We got you. <laughs> I was asking, I was asking, Bugsy, I was asking if Dunbar, I hate technology. I was I asking if, if that Dunbar team you played on was the greatest of all time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I believe that we were the best team that ever been assembled. And fortunate enough for us, we all lived in the same neighborhood. Wow. And uh, cool. it was just a treat knowing that we was had so much talent, knowing that we was capable of doing something special. But it goes credit to the Coach Wade because he understood the type of talent that we had. He knew how to kind of make us accountable. And he also... Uh, and still gratitude into it. So having that understanding and being able to, to put that at a perspective allowed us to be the team that we needed to be. That's amazing. I think anybody who's listening should should uh, Google uh, Dunbar, 1982. They were the Reggie Lewis, Reggie Williams, Wingate. You guys played the best teams in the country, and I think you stomped on all of them by some av crazy average. Uh, I mean, you won every. It was it was what a remarkable team. Anyway, listen, I'm going to let you go. Thanks uh, so much, buddy. And an I will send you. I, I will send Bogues Corporate your son's uh, drawing of him when he's finally fed, finished with it. His son's drawing every NBA great. player now, and he's already working on one of yours. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Baker. Um, what a book! I got to tell you, I was grip. I I was in it right from the beginning because one of the forwards is someone that you've seen growing up when he was just a little Curry because you played with Del Curry. You Ooh. saw both of those boys grow up to be the NBA stars they are. One of them probably the greatest shooter that ever lived. He does a forward. And midway through the forward, he says, growing up with the Bugs family, he says that your daughter was his first crush. And I wonder, what was, as a father, although you could do better than Steph, you could do worse than Steph Curry, but I wonder what was going through your head when you finally read this forward uh -huh. that this basically almost son to you is doing, and he's talking about having a crush on your daughter. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. But I knew that they was close during that time as, we was, as they was growing up. And that, that's just like kids, you know, especially right. when 
you don't know any better. Uh, you just, uh, especially when you're a little boy, uh, you, that first opportunity, you, you feel that little affection for that opposite sex, and you're like, oh, I like her. That's just want to be. So that was that moment going on back there. But, you know, we was close. Uh, I'm just so grateful to be around Steph and Seth and the, and the Curry family. Um, as you just alluded to, what he's turned out to be is just, is just remarkable, as well as Seth. I mean, I didn't realize that I was giving that little kid that little airplane ride in the locker room that he was going to turn out to be the greatest shooter in it, that ever laced it up in the NBA. So it's, it's a blessing to witness it all. He references you all the time, talks about what a great influence um, you were. I, uh, you know, we started the show, and these are always wasted on the guests. We had, I, I, I really put a lot of effort into the, um, the, the montage we had for you at the beginning of the show, and a lot of it were you turning steals into art but you know what else I had to run? Your clip with Larry David on Curb Your Enthusiasm. <laughs> I had to do that. Uh, too much. Joanne is uh, is an actress. Has done a lot of improv. Yeah. I want to know everything because, like, okay, you've had you've had a lot of acting gigs. But what you always read about Curb Your Enthusiasm is that there really isn't a script. Like you got to ad lib <laughs> all of that shit. So how how did you approach? And I guess you do that in locker room interviews. But like, how did you approach that? Well, it was fun. I mean, for one, I'm just so grateful and thankful that I had that opportunity to work with uh, Larry David and Richard Lewis. They had me laughing the entire time on the set. I mean, you're right. It was just improv. I mean, you had to just kind of they give you a storyline and you pretty much have lived the rest of it. Um, but and I told them they had the right guy for the part, too. Um, yeah. <laughs> I remember yeah. I, I heard you say that in a podcast and I had yet to see the scene and everyone else was laughing. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. It's just like, they had the right guy. And then when I realized what the part was about, I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, was, it was just fun. It was just so much fun, man, working with those guys. And again, just having that opportunity, I'm just so grateful. I never consider myself an actor, you know, just getting these opportunities to do cameos and be part of these special shows that I have the opportunity to to take part of it. I mean, just a blessing. Yeah. As an actor, I'm waiting for basketball players to ask me to just like come on the court and, <laughs> and shoot a few and just like see what happens. Um, there's no script and uh, <laughs> I'm waiting. Well, I'm, I'm holding a, out. Well, I'm, I'm going to send you that opportunity. I'm going to send yes. you that opportunity. <laughs> um, well, and, but I'll tell you what, man, you're actually a legit actor at this point. You've had a lot of cameos. Um, I want to know before I get, we get into maybe what some of your favorite or weirdest ones were, Juana Man. Yes. Juana Man, if it's on, I'm watching it. But I also have to ask you, okay, so Joe, this is about um, a guy that is like shunned by the NBA for some scandal, puts a wig on and joins the WNBA. Wow. Now, do we, all of us here collectively think that that, that would be made today? No. <laughs> I don't. It's great, but I don't know if it would. I know t times have changed. <laughs> yes, times have changed. You're right about that. And uh, when they approached me about that, I was actually in Charlotte, and uh, it was just you know, again, I just was thankful to be part of you know opportunity to be on that big screen like that. I mean, it was a fun. It was a fun movie. And at the time, I was coaching in the WNBA. Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was the head coach, uh, and that was something that you know kind of. Re was relevant at the time, but you did, you're right. Times have changed. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really quick on that point from coaching, you know, I, I was doing some research, read some Wikipedia, so correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, you have coached both the WNBA and also at a boys high school. <laughs> and I want to know what's more challenging. <laughs> Sometimes she hates women. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I'm, tr I'm truly curious. Well, they, they, they both were challenging within themselves. Uh, for the women's, I should say, you know, having the opportunity to work with some professional women. I mean, that's exactly what they were. They came in each and every day, gave me their best and was professional about it. And I'm uh, saying them how they conduct themselves as professional women, because if people don't realize the challenges that they face, you know, not mm. only that they play the sport, but they also mothers um, sure. and, and nourishers and so forth and, and, and the household of the, uh, the backbone of their families. So that kind of, you know, that criteria makes a challenge within itself. So it was such a, a beautiful opportunity for me working with them. And as for the kids, you know, it was a, just a rewarding self motivate, a self reward for me trying to mentor these kids 
and where I used to be, you know, giving them understanding how to be a student athlete as opposed to just being an athlete and uh, giving them that perspective, you know, having them have that understanding, you know, moving forward was such an, uh, you know, a good opportunity that I felt that was well uh, pointed down to me that I should be servicing out to these kids. Well, and like as a point guard, even before he got the coaching gigs and he was still playing, you're kind of already a coach. Yeah, you're a playmaker. You're seeing the you're seeing the you're seeing the the hard the hardwood different than everyone else is, uh, and making adjustments therein. I wonder, did you find when you first started coaching the WNBA that some of the blunt force trauma that you would either give teammates or people that you were mentoring or stuff like that that would work on guys did not that that particular tactic would not work with women and did you have to like sort of change tactics at all well not necessarily you know sports is sports and right. the game is the game is the game and uh you talking to them just like you was talking to your male con uh, yeah con- bill con- come and, on uh, truly i've got a lot of work to do yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah we got to give them set that same type of motivational uh that they need as well as the, the screwing the the, the 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 criticism that comes with it as well but it's no it's no difference in terms of how you teach and how you motivate that makes sense and i'm a terrible person for even considering asking it (laughs) um all right now i have heard this story uh several times um or we might even call it an urban myth but i've never actually heard you comment on it uh this would involve i believe you were with charlotte and this involved uh i think jr reed and you were (laughs) you were a legendary high school wrestler Mm. and i believe all six foot nine 250 pounds of him was sort of like giving you shit about wrestling. You dropped him right on his head. Not only that, we have witnesses from the entire Hornet oh, team. Wow. And they have all discussed it. I've never heard you discuss it, but it, first of all, I wish there were security cameras. And uh, from your end, what do you remember and how did that go down? Because I, I it's pretty confirmed at this point. <laughs> yeah, the, the guys like telling that story. Yes. Um, you know, of course, I, I was a wrestler and I was good at it. And JR was kind of yapping off and was going on at that particular time. And then, of course, he kind of got pushed me to a point. And then to that point where I just so happened just picked him up and just threw him in that little basket that we had our laundry with, you know, so there was more. Oh, that. that is just so much, yeah. not just wrestling technique, but just a lot of Baltimore just pounding on right there on his chest. And like I, Oh, I would have killed to have seen that. And, uh, and boy, as great as that story is, I was like, uh, I didn't know until recently that at five years old, he gets buckshot in him. Oh God! From, um, it was based, essentially a like a guy a, a guy in your street had gotten robbed and just started you shooting a shotgun everywhere, and you got unfortunately a bit of it. They missed your head, correct? Uh, yeah. Well, he, no, the, the person didn't get robbed. It was a fight that took place right, out okay. in that neighborhood, and one of the kids took a rock and went and broke the store on one of the store owners' window, and he came running out of his store and went straight to his shed grabbed this double barrel shotgun and just start shooting through the neighborhood. Fortunate enough, the bullet missed my head, but the buckshots hit my arms and my legs. Oh, unbelievable. And now, you know, I think PTSD, we hear it all the time, is a, a very overused term. And I'm yeah. sure there are veterans that hear it and don't like when it's used sometimes. But that there qualifies. I mean, from your end, do you feel that you got PTSD from that? I mean, you were very young, but old enough to remember, certainly, and you got the scars to show for it. I mean, how, if it at all, has that affected you? Well, I thought, I, I believe it affected me in a positive way, because at that particular time, I was trying to pursue this game that many felt that taller and bigger players should be only the ones should be playing it. And early on in my career and early on in my life, I should say, before that incident actually happened, those words really used to affect me. And it used to really bother me. That's one of the times I used to go home crying to my mom and telling her how difficult the kids were out there, you know, towards me. But after the after that dramatic incident that I just endured, I mean the words was at least in my words. Yeah. yeah. So that makes absolute that kind of helped me change my mindset. 
that makes absolute sense. Um, yeah, they uh, and it's just it's different with you too. No, when don't you wish get, anybody had to go through that though, just to get comfortable. About what was, who they are. I mean, obviously, kids kids' bodies are so malleable and bounce back so much more than my old ass does. But I mean, what was the recovery time like for something like that? What, uh, if from what you recall. Yeah, well, it took a little time to recover. Um, you know, of course, you had still the, the bandages all over. I still got one buckshot in my arm that I carry around. Are you kidding me? Unfucking believable. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, it's does still it set off an airport alarms? <laughs> it does not. It does not. That's but they all say that it's it could be dangerous if some of the ones that was in, if they moved in a different direction. But mainly, the rest of them all came out, and I had them taken out. But I got one that's still on my arm that kind of... Unbelievable. I can never complain about root canals again. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, I bitch about stuff like that way too much in front of Joanne. But um, unreal. But speaking of you growing up and wrestling, you played a, a bunch of sports. Um, you were great at wrestling and basketball. Uh, two things. Like, uh, first, why why basketball and not wrestling? Like, why did you continue on with that? And second, do you think that the wrestling experience actually influenced your play yeah. on the court? Well, uh, the answer to the first basketball was actually an opportunity. It was a situation just to prove not only just me wrong, but I had a, a strong calling for it. And, yeah. uh, and, and it, it was more of a, a means of me, you know, understanding what was given to me, you know, the gift. And once mm-hmm. I learned the information, once I understood how to play the game and how to maneuver through these barriers that folks that want to place on you, you know, I start to feel good about it. And I always took the mindset, if I played against the best, if I had success against the best, I must be included with the best. Yeah. And having that mindset allowed me to keep climbing up the ladder and keep, uh, you know, kind of believing that this is sort of something that possibly can happen for me going forward. Give me a means to get an education, not even yeah. thinking so much about the NBA, but just a matter of changing my my lifestyle where I was at the particular time. And wrestling could have been that as well because my coach, my wrestling coach was pursuing me to do just that. And they felt like wrestling, because it didn't come with many criteria in terms of being tall or, or skillful and that sort of thing, is a matter of being quick and strong and agile. And I think they felt like that suited me more because of my size and that could give me you know, an opportunity to, to, to change my trajectory in terms of, you know, what my conditions were in that particular sport. But wrestling and basketball happened to be in the same, you know, happened at the same time and during the same season. Got and I had, to choose, I had to choose one or the other. But I, I do say that uh, some form of wrestling had an impact on the trans, trans, uh, trans, translation of, of basketball. Um, so it had an impact that, on J.R. Reed. <laughs> <laughs> it had a big impact on him. Yeah. yeah I would say it definitely had Well, it's weird because, like, athletes at an elite level, they always just end up being good at everything. I don't know. It's like it's in their DNA. And one of them that I love is that you're apparently a fucking killer ping pong player, correct? Oh. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. Now, you're an ambassador for the Hornets. We all know who the owner is. And there is a great anecdote about Michael Jordan uh, with regards to Bill Cartwright or somebody beat him at ping pong. So freak that he is, he goes, he gets his own table. He talks to people that are like almost pro ping pong so that he can once again play him and school him. I have to ask, we know you're a competitive guy yourself. I mean, you have to be considering your career. Has have you and Jordan ever faced off ping pong wise? Never played ping pong. I didn't even know he played ping pong. That's an interesting Oh, uh, now he wants to do a match. Uh, yeah, and I, you know what? It might have been one of those things where he just wanted to beat that guy and he gave it up after that because he did what he had to do. But I, yeah. who knows? He might have stuck with it. I don't know. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that maybe that that needs to take place. I would. I want, well, I want full, I want full feedback when it does. Have you seen? Have you guys competed in stuff like whether it be? I mean, God, you watch like Last Dance and stuff. You see him playing like, uh, f- playing coin games right before you know a finals game or something <laughs> like that. Just he's always doing this, you know. I, I, have you seen any of that? Have you done any of that with him with regards to the Hornets overall? No, not with the Hornets overall. Of course, you know we had a, some good card games and doing our Space Jam. Oh yeah. Time yeah. on the set. 
Those are some good moments right there. I love, um, I'm trying to remember which player it was, but I think it might have been Hardaway. You were injured on the set of Space Jam, and they had to have Hardaway do a stand a couple stand-ins for him. And I hope that you gave him shit by de- saying, you're nothing more than a stand-in for the actor <laughs> in this movie right now. You do realize that. But <laughs> well, well, I, don't, I don't know if he was going, he was a stand-in, but I, they didn't actually think that I would be able to and read my lines or do my do the same because I just had happened just had had surgery on my knee, um, and I don't know exactly when the time that he went out there to do it. But when I went out, I mean, they was so uh, creative in terms of uh, obliging and, and making it easier for me to be able to do some of the scenes that I had to do, especially walking wise. I couldn't. Oh walk. my god! Yeah. yeah. Um, so they, uh- Speaking of your knee injuries, injuries in general and surgery, just um, being with how you grew up and your brother battling drug addiction, was pain medication something you were wary of? Like, was that something you had to make conscious decisions about? Because I feel like I would be nervous, you know, if it's sort of in my family or like in my DNA, that it could become a problem. So is that something you you kind of focused on? Well, and also if he's taking his brother in and he's trying to stay clean and that's yeah. in the house too, you know? Yeah, well, not necessarily for me. I wasn't thinking in, that re- in those uh, lines, uh, especially in terms of my brother, you know, he was dealing with different types of drugs yeah. and other things. So uh, that, I wasn't too concerned about that. And not only from, and, and for myself as well, I know I wasn't the type of person to become addictive to anything. And yeah. uh, I'm a very high pain tolerance. Mm. Um, so I tolerated enough pain in, in terms of being able to overcome that before I kind of took my morphine that, 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 yeah. that, that some of that pain, but now I wasn't really too concerned about it, but um that it was a good question. That is something that you do need to be concerned about, especially if you're going through situations where you got family members involved. There is such a sea change when it comes to pain, the uh, what what people look at fav- favorably as far as painkilling is concerned. From when you played till now, now you have uh, so, what is it? It's got to be like 20 states now where weed is legalized. Players mm-hmm. now, current players, will do podcasts where they're smoking weed. And in your day, one bad urine sample. And that could be the season for you. Uh, like, where? How did you see it from the way it was when you were playing? Do you see the benefits for how it helps players with pain now? Are there stuff that you're for or against? I, well, wh- I, how do you see that? Because I do feel like Silver's probably one of the more progressive, um, you know, commissioners out there when it comes to yes. being like, you know, maybe let's look the other way when it comes to something like seeing a little THC in your in your in your urine. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, like you said, a lot of things have changed and stuff has come to the forefront. And I think Adam Silver is one of those best, one of those commissions, uh, not uh, uh, afraid or shy away from, you know, those type of topics. And you got all sorts of pain medication that take place. And a lot of guys do get addicted on some of these uh, prescriptions that prescribe from, from these doctors. And sometimes looking at a different type of way of, 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 of providing uh, healing or, or some type of, of way of getting them better, feeling better in a way, the way they don't become addictive and they don't become something that's more harmful for their body. That's where they look into these holistic type of healing situations or opportunities to try to, you know, make them feel better. But again, I, I, the league has, has really tried to become at the forefront of a lot of those issues. And um, and these CBD oils now coming yes. to the effect where they having to help certain ailments. You know, you got anxiety that's going on. We got mental health now is being spoken uh, very highly on these issues. And so you got to just kind of do your homework, do your due diligence, and just mm-hmm. try to come to the best you know conclusion that it fits the narrative for everybody to be safe. Yeah. I interviewed Joe Kim Noah about eight years ago at the practice facility in Illinois in Deerfield uh, for the Bulls. And I remember he was having some really bad foot issues that eventually got him out of the league. But I remember right when I got close to his locker, uh, it smelled like Jamaica. (laughs) <laughs> and you know, and no one. And I, I remember thinking, like, you know, 15 years ago, that just would not happen in that very same <laughs> practice facility. But yeah, no, it's it's very true. Um, I want to make sure we ha- uh, have a little time to discuss your family foundation. Yes, um, empowering at-risk youth, offering them meals, access to education, and job training. 
Um, yeah, will you just tell us a little bit about that and what's like coming up next for this foundation? Well, that's exactly it. I mean, we, we're trying to lend resources to these kids that skill bound tra uh, trade kids that have aspirations to continue to work with their hands. And, and a lot of organizations focused on the IT kids, IT students, the four year universities. Uh, we believe that this is a pathway where these kids can really change the trajectory, not only for themselves, but for their families. And being able to, you know, help the community and, and reach out to these families, you know, shouldn't have to make a decision whether to, to put gas in their car, have food on their table. So being able to provide them with those resources, um, give them those, you know, means of helping them become better individuals. I mean, it just, uh, you know, something that I've always been striving to do is what some has been put in this type of situation, this position. And we do have a spring uh, event that's coming up where we will feed, we feed the community. Uh, we have reached over a thousand family members already. And I was so thankful for the organizations that always help and take part in providing those type of uh, resources that we give to these families. And, uh, and we're going to continue until, you know, the last breath that I have, I try to make sure these families take some of the less pressure, not only on the food aspects of it, but as well as for as their kids and scholarships to where they ain't got to worry about those financial aspects or the burden that they got to be dealing with on a daily basis. Yeah. You are a good man. Um, and Better God, we us. were, yeah. Oh yeah. We're not even really considered people. Um, but, <laughs> and also, and again, really before we let you go, um, I don't know if we have a screen grab of it, but just let's promote the book one more time. And also just tell us like, what was the, what was the best and worst part about revisiting your life? I know you did like an autobiography early on in your career, but this is a lot more wide scoped and uh, revealing and great. Uh, best and worst parts about doing something like this? Well, the first one I did, as you just alluded to, it was mainly because my pops and one of my good friends and Reggie Lewis had passed away. And it was at the beginning of my right. career. And it was kind of angry a book. But this was a more, lot more substance. I had an opportunity to kind of grow a little bit, to live a little, to impact some people's life. Currently, that's playing the game as well as the uh, time that I play, and it's about, you know, a passion, you know, a passion that someone have, and they just chased it each and every day, um, about giving back to the community, about uh, relationships, not only with the players, but with me and my wife that divorced for 10 years. And got and back together. All yeah. of a sudden, we got back together, and, you know, we've been remarried and since 2015, um, something that's not heard of quite often. Seriously. <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, the rekindle our family. And, I mean, it's, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to put it back out there because everybody go through issues. Everybody go through times in their lives where they're not feeling that confident about themselves. And hopefully they can pick it up and, and see some of the things that I did in my journey and give them some type of confidence or belief that, you know, it's not anything is impossible to do if I put my mind to it. And, uh, and having that understanding, hopefully they can benefit from it. We've got a million more questions. I would love to have you back uh, whenever you're able. And uh, thank you so much. And I will say that if I ever bump into you in a bathroom, I will respectfully pee in the stall. Yes. Unlike horrible, horrible Larry David. Didn't even try to hide the stare. Uh, just <laughs> awful. <laughs> thank you so much, man. I was looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Muggsy. Thank you.